Hi, my name is Lee J, and welcome to this podcast, Chatting with Lee. Uh, each week, we get the chance to chat with somebody, and here's who I've been chatting with this time. I am very pleased and privileged to welcome to the programme singer, songwriter, poet, author and actor, Fish. How are you doing? Not too bad, sitting in a drinking, you know, grey Scotland at the moment. <laughs> just uh, in the middle of just finishing off the Velschmerz album and getting ready for a UK tour. So it's, uh, it's pretty hectic at the moment. And this afternoon is going to a video edit, which is kind of... Um, I was tedious hours in, it, in an <laughs> afternoon watching spinning discs, you know what I mean? Oh, dear. But it's good, it's good at the moment. I mean, it's just very active, you know? So it's, as I said, I mean, you know, we're just f finishing off the record, and so the album's already for going out in, in July. It's been a long time coming, but it's been worth the wait. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that album. Um, but just just take you back a few years. Um, I guess most people got to know you through Marillion. Um, you were with them from 81 till 88, did, what was it, 11 top 40 singles, and um, you had five top 10 albums including Misplaced Childhood, which was, I guess, the biggest one. What was it like at that time? You know, the, the, it must have been a real sort of snowball feel. It was, uh, yeah, there was a lot of hard work. I mean, Warners have just got the the remaster of Script for Jester Seer coming out that we've, on the, we've got on the website, on the fishmusic.scot website. And it's been interesting, you know, going back over that period and thinking back to kind of when it all started. I mean, it was a long, long time ago. Mm. I mean, this year is, you know, the 30th anniversary of my first solo album. I think it puts it into context. I mean, I did four albums with Marillion, and I was with them for seven years, but I did 30 years after that as a solo artist. But, I mean, you know, by then it was heady times. It was, you know, in the, in the 80s, it was kind of a very different music business to the one that is now. I mean, people actually bought albums rather mm. than listening to them on Spotify. And, uh, you know, so it was, it was very different. It was a different vibe. It was, um, I think that the music business was more carefree. It was more exciting than it is now. I mean, I think just the, the way that it's metamorphosized into kind of this kind of digital industry now. And, and as I said, you know, when you've got Warners putting out, you know, remasters albums that were made in, in 1983, you know, it's, it goes to show, like, where the record companies are at as well. I mean, they're yeah. very aware that, you know, they've got catalogs to exploit because it's just so different. I mean, you know, people don't sell record their product. People don't normally don't buy albums now. You know, they listen to it digitally. I mean, I had my 29-year-old daughter here just the other day and I was asking her, I said, what was the last time you bought an album? And she can't even remember, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it means that a lot of people are having to play live now and, you know, the you know, going out and and, and playing gigs is is uh, the, 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 just about the only way you can, you know, depend on an income these days, which means that there's a lot more bands touring and there's only so many venues. And, you know, the bottom line is, you know, people have only got so much to spend on entertainment and they've got to make choices on who they're going to see. So it's become a very um, competitive industry now as, as far as the live scene goes. Yeah. The, I want to ask you about your influences because I've got a list of people that, in front of me, Genesis, Pink Floyd, Moody Blues, etc., etc., all of whom are influences of yours. But one of them is a band that I thought was so underrated and so brilliant, and that was Alex Harvey. Did you, did you ever see yeah, Alex Harvey? Yeah, I mean, you know, the Alex Harvey band, I mean, I wouldn't say it was a major influence. It was something that became a lot more aware of in the 80s as, as it went on. And, you know, I think, you know, what, you know when you're young, you know, you've got your base influences, which for me, for me, were all the early 70s progressive bands. But, you know, you discover bands like Joni Mitchell and, and, and things like that and, and, you know, Little Feet and, and, and you know, artists. And, and, and you discover more artists and bands as, as you move on and, and people open up. Uh, um, they open up to you and, and, and introduce you to different things. And I think yeah. the Harvey Band was one of those bands. I mean, I saw them when I was really young supporting The Who uh, on the Who Put The Boot In Tour. I think it was 1976. I, it was, um, and you know, it was that was the first time I saw them, and it was amazing. I mean, I was lucky that, you know, I got to meet the guys, and and you know, I did the uh, um, Boston Tea Party. I did a cover version of that yes. with the original members of the band, and when they were looking to try and make a kind of comeback, and they were looking for other singers, it was myself and Dan McCaffrey for Nazareth for going out and 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 sharing vocals, you know, as the band were kind of running through their paces and getting used to playing live again, but. You know, sadly that never happened, and 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 Ted, who was Ted McKenna, the drummer, who was a great friend of mine, sadly died back in uh, January nineteen. So I mean, the, it's, it's kind of the mm. band's kind of uh, done its time now. I mean, Zal Clemenson doesn't want to go on the road, and no. 
you know, I mean, Chris Glenn still plays, but I mean, it was a great band. It was very influential to a lot, a lot of Scottish artists. But I mean, as I said, I discovered them pretty late. But I mean, I was, it was pretty much uh, in awe of what uh, Alex did on the stage. He was a fantastic frontman. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's, it's such an interesting frontman. You know, theatrical, but on the other hand, brilliant at what he did. I've, I've got to ask you because, you know, it's, it's one of those questions. I'm sorry. But is it true that you got your nickname because the landlord, when you were working as a, in the forestry commission, I think it was, gave you the nickname Fish because you spent so much time in the bath? No, 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 no. Ah, good. I had a landlady and she used to charge me. She decided after the big for a couple of months that she was going to start charging me for bath so she could get more money. <laughs> and I was bringing wood back from the, 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 the my forestry job because I was, I was up cutting down trees and things, you know. And it was, it was way up the northeast of Scotland. And it was, I used to take, you know, all the other nights I used to manage to get showers in a community centre that I was working in. But, but the Thursday night I used to get my, my bath, my token bath, and I used to make sure I spent a long time in it. And her being a proverbial, cliched, kind of stereotypical Scottish landlady was drinking loads of tea, and it was like, you should have got the next door neighbours if she wanted to use the toilet, because the bath was in the only toilet now. So I used to stay in there for an hour, and it was a friend of mine that actually said, you know, use some sort of fish or something, because he'd waited on me for ages to come. And the name stuck, you know, it was a, you know it's been an oft-repeated story. Ah, right, okay. Sorry, sorry to have brought that one up. Now, I know you, you did your first gig in 1980. Uh, in Gala Shields at the Golden Lion Pub. What was that like? I bet you were really nervous, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, I was, it was first there. I mean, I was quite a late starter. I mean, I was kind of 21, uh, 21 year old, 22 year old at that time. And it was, uh, it was just singing cover versions, but I, you know, I wanted to become a singer, but the band they were hobbyists, you know, they, they were quite happy playing for beer money and I wanted to make something more of it, which is why, you know, I kind of went out in search of another band and eventually found Marillion in, in January 81, you know, when mm. I joined them. Now, you've, you've worked incredibly hard um, with the solo albums and the, the things that you've done since Marillion. I didn't realise, but in, in 2004, Classic Rock ranked you as number 49 on its list of 100 greatest frontmen, describing the theatrical delivery as a major factor in, in Marillion's rise. Is that something which you, you adopted? Is it something which is just in you? When you perform, I think it actually came about. I think because of the, the genre of music we were playing. I mean, you know, playing long songs. I mean, there was stories. I mean, I'm a writer who can sing. I'm not really a singer I'm, uh, that can. You know, I'm not a singer that can write. You know, writing is, is kind of like my, my mainstay. And you know? I mean, I would never consider myself a great technical singer by any stretch of the imagination. But I mean, uh, I think you know, I moved into it because it was. You know, progressive rock was a vehicle that I could deliver the lyrics that I was writing on. So. You know, and delivering stories, then you, you, it became more theatrical. When we played the pubs in 1981, 82, you know, it was a kind of a major weapon and a kind of armory for being noticed, you know. You, you mentioned there the acting on stage, but you've also done some acting on TV and in movies, haven't you? Yeah, I did, I did, I did a fair bit of TV work, you know, kind of paying my dues and stuff like Tiger and The Bill and stuff like that. And I did. I did a couple of movies. Chasing the Deer was the first movie made, which was an independent one. Way back in, I think I was in 94. And then I did The Jacket where Adrian Brody and I did, it was mm. a, kind of an illustrious lineup. It was Adrian Brody's first film after he won the Oscar on the piano. And I was sitting in a scene with Jennifer Jason Lee and uh, um, Chris Christopherson and, <laughs> and Daniel Craig as well. He was kind of... <laughs> He was just busting on the scene, and you know it was. Uh, I loved it. But, I mean, my problem was that you know when I, I, I started to, when I started to examine a, a potential acting career, it was in the mid eighties, and I was in a band, and it was impossible me for me to kind of really examine an acting career when I was in a band because, you know, if, if I was out working on a set, then what did the others do? And it was kind of, I wouldn't say frowned upon, but it was I was dissuaded from <laughs> taking on things and. You know, I mean, some of the stuff was, you know, was. I mean, I was up. I auditioned for Rambo, auditioned for a Bond movie, and things. Always as baddies, you know. Yeah. But um, you know, but I mean, it's, it's when I went solo in in in, in 1987, you know, it kind of opened up a little bit. I mean, Duke City, I did for the BBC, which is quite an acclaimed, um, yeah. uh, claim series, and you know, that, that, I loved doing it. But I mean, I just didn't have the time. And the problem were, you know, trying to combine an acting career and a singing career is that. You know, you know, I was going for roles that were well down the pecking order, as you'd expect. I mean, you know, the reality was that, you know, I wasn't kind of a distinguished or, or kind of experienced actor. So 
And you, with, with that happening, you know, it could take months for somebody to make a decision on shoot dates. And in those months, you know, I'm booking a tour or whatever. So there was always a conflict. And, you know, the, the bottom line was that, you know, music was uh, my principal occupation, you know, and it was, um, so, I mean, music always got the touch. But, I mean, you know, I think, you know, when I retire in the, in the next year and a half, I mean, one of the things I'd love to get involved with is screenplays. But, I mean, you know, this is, you know, I've just completed, or in the process of completing the last album, Velschmerz. And then I go out and, on a tour this year. I mean, mm. I'm in the UK in March. And then in, in um, mainland Europe in October, November. And then we shoot into 2021 and the, basically my farewell tour will, will close in, in, at the beginning of 2022. And after that, you know, I want to focus on writing. I mean, both on kind of, you know, the obvious kind of autobiography stuff and, you know, and some creative writing as well. I mean, just, you know, freeing from the shackles, uh, having to put everything in rhyme and working within the kind of restrictions of the songwriting, you know. Are you a prolific writer? Do Do you find it very easy to write? No, it's just it, it depends. It depends what I'm writing about. You know, I mean, uh, you know, as I said, I mean, even you know, as I said before about acting and music. I mean, you know, trying to write and and, and have creative writing at the same time as, as you know, writing albums. I mean, when I'm writing an album, it's just a completely different mindset you know, mm. to, to to working in, in anything else. And um, but you know I'll, I'll look forward to that in the space in 22. I'll, I'll I'll come across that when I come across it. Now the album that you're working on at the moment, Welsh Merce, Have I got that right? Welsh Of course it is. It's, it's German. a German word. It yeah. means kind of pain of the world or feeling the pain of the world. It's um, the, the literal translation is world pain. Yeah. But it's it's just about it's, it's an album that's about. Um, Rather than being about corporations and big banks and big business and kings and queens and politics, it's more it addresses kind of people living today. I mean, all the subject matters range from, you know, there's a 60 minute song called Rose of Damascus, which is all about uh, a refugee coming out of Syria, to um, songs about mental health and, and, and walking on eggshells, which is about a relationship and, you know, men having mental health issues within the, the, the two kind of proponents. Uh, uh, Waverly Steps, which is another big number about um, it's about male mental health and and and, and suicide. To, I mean, it sounds very dark, but I mean, in the same way as uh, Mendes did a, the, the American Beauty film, which dealt with very dark subject matters in a very beautiful way. It's that's kind of how Velschmerz is. says, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of um, the, the music that's wrapped around the lyrics. You know, it's, it's very beautiful. It's kind of. It's, it's just an album about living in the world today and, and kind of the problems that people have, that individuals have. So every song is about an individual dealing with an aspect of their world, you know. Now, that, there's a track which I've listened to a few times and it, it really gets into me. And that's uh, Man With A Stick, which I think is from Parley With Angels, but it's also going to be on the album, isn't it? Yeah, Parley With Angels was a kind of prequel to the album. It was kind of... You know, we, you know, it was kind of like saying, well, yes, we are actually working on this. So we put out three songs which are all being remixed for the album. And uh, Man With A Stick was uh, it one single of the year from Planet Rock in, in 2018. You know, that's how kind of far back it was. But I mean, it was uh, that was a great accolade to pick up. I mean, it was a song that was kind of inspired by the death of my father in May 16. I mean, mm. you know, writing this album, the album's been written over a long period of time for various reasons. I mean... When my dad when my dad died, it was kind of I didn't realise how much it had affected me until the end of the year when I kind of you know woke up in the garden. It was like you know where did that year go? And um, and then you know the following year I had you know I had sepsis twice, so I was you know oh, in an ambulance twice into the, the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh, which was kind of close run things. And um, so I mean yeah, there was a lot of stuff happening around the album. There was a lot of issues in my personal life that affected the kind of creation of the album. The other thing that I've noticed about the album is that you're actually going to do it on vinyl as a double gatefold. Well, I've been doing vinyl for quite a while. I mean, Feast the Consequences, the last album that came out. Yeah. I mean, I was released on vinyl. And, you know, there's, I'm, I'm, you know, obviously with, with this album, I mean, it makes sense to go with vinyl. I mean, it's a, the, the Velchmelz is about 86, 86 minutes long plus. And it's, it's basically, it's a double album. So we've decided to go out with... Rather than go to one CD with a lot of music on it and putting some spillage on it, the Blu-ray on the deluxe version, we're going out with two CDs that are about 40 odd minutes long, which is the same kind of length mm. as, you know, what albums, how albums used to be. And there's no fillers on, on Velchmatz at all. You know, there was no fillers on uh, Velchmatz at all. 
So, I mean, I'm in a situation where, you know, we, we've got a, 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 a real double album. And, the, you know, and obviously with vinyl, I mean, it's perfect for, for a vinyl release. It fits, it fits perfectly onto the, onto the two discs. You know? it, it's um, an excellent format. I mean, so many people still use vinyl. So many people still want vinyl. They want to touch that, that, that product. They want to feel it, don't they? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's still demand for vinyl. I mean, it's not as, as, as great as people make out it to be, but, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not anywhere near the same volumes that, you know, I sold even on the Vigil in the Wilderness and Mirror album, mm. you know, which is another album. I mean, Vigil, my first solo album, is 30 years old this year. So we've got remasters of that coming out in uh, October together with the second solo album, Internal. And we'll be doing vinyl on that as well. I mean, you know, it's, it's a kind of partner release to, to the, main, the main album release. And then, I mean, you know, seeing what I said right at the beginning of this interview, I mean, you know, the problem is nowadays that people aren't buying albums, you know, yeah. they're not even buying CDs now. People are so used to hearing it on YouTube and Spotify. I mean, on Spotify, I've got something like 50,000 accredited, signed on, you know, fans that, that, that you know, I've signed up to my Spotify account. And yet, you know, if I sold 50,000 albums, you know, I'd be laughing, you know, but we don't do that now. No. Yeah, you know, the same way. I mean, I remember when we played Spain recently. Well, last year, recently, a few years back, and you know, we we checked out how many albums we actually sold in Spain. It was minimal, and you know, we said to them, "Why aren't people buying albums?" They said, "Well, we download them, and they don't even pay for the downloads." And I think people have got to remember that you know it costs a lot of money to make an album. I mean, you know, this Welshmerz is probably going to be in the region a hundred thousand pounds to record. Because we've got elements of the Scottish Chamber Orchestra on it, we've got real brass, we've got real percussionists, we've got a real oud player and things, and you know because we want sonically make it sound outstanding. I mean, it's right in cinema for your ears. But I mean, sometimes it becomes irritating when you realise you, you spend so much time in the studio making something, and people are listening to it on an MP3 and an iPhone. You know? Yeah. I mean, when you when you figure out what goes into production of an album, and when you are using real instruments with real people playing them, it, it is it just makes a totally different thing of it, doesn't it? I mean, but it's the same in movies. It's, yeah. you know, it's the same in movies. It's the same in journalism. You know, I mean, you know, it's journalists that, that you know people don't pay for journalism nowadays. You know, they expect it to turn to go on the internet and read a paper for free. And yeah. in the same way, it's like people downloading pirate movies. You know, and it's um, you, people have got used to things for free. And, you know, they forget that in order to create this, this stuff, you know, you know, you know, you would expect to walk in a, a car showroom and take, walk and drive a car out for nothing. And in the same way, it's, it's like people forget that, you know, there's musicians and that there's, there's a lot of um, engineers, producers, you know, that, that are all involved in creating an album, you mm. know, that, that all depend on, on, on music to make a living, you know. And I think sometimes people need to have a, take a step back and, and remember that, you know. As you say, you've got the finishing of the album, then you've got the tour, and then sadly you're going to do a farewell tour. Yeah, as I said before, you know, that's going to be 2021 22, but I'm not thinking about that yet. Good. I'm more concerned about this album and the UK tour that's happening in the next three weeks. Excellent. Excellent. Well, look, Fish, we want to wish you well with that. We want to say, going to look forward to this album. Um, as I say, I'm going to play Man with a Stick immediately after this. And I want to find out some more about some of these other tracks because they look fascinating. Rose to Damascus, yeah, Walking I mean, on Eggshells. Yeah, if anybody's interested in finding out what's going on, they can go to fishmusic.scot. Very easy. Fishmusic.scot. And then they can find out about tour dates and everything else that's going on. They'll find out more about the release of Elsewhere. The next, uh, the next single of the album is going to be coming out on March the 12th. And that's going to be the title track, Velchmerz, and there'll be a video to accompany that that people can see on, on, on that uh, fishmusic.scot website. Brilliant. I'm glad you got that in. Okay, cause... brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time, and all the best okay. for the future. Take care, ma'am. And you. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Ma Thank you for listening. You can find links to more of my interviews on my Facebook page and on YouTube channel, Chatting with Lee.